The guest star tonight is not Joy Dawson. She's not worth crossing the road to hear. The guest star tonight is the lover of my soul, Jesus. And I suggest you do what I do all the time, especially at night in my room. I live completely alone. I'm 90 years of age and uh, I need to live alone because nobody else could ever put up with the radical love life that I have with Jesus. I throw him kisses in the night and yell praises at him and totally abandon to him. So uh, he's the big guest tonight. He's the one. I'm just, do you know what I am? I'm just a little tiny messenger girl who's been standing in his presence, listening to him. He's been talking, I've been writing, and I'm going to deliver what he says. So who gets all the glory and who should we be excited about? Jesus, Jesus. yes, okay. Why don't you throw him some kisses? Come on, get like a kid. (laughs) Hallelujah. Gorgeous Jesus, wonderful, adorable Jesus. Hallelujah. When I don't know what else to say to him, I just say, you're too much, because I don't know what else to say. (laughs) It's a great privilege to be here tonight in this very vital church. I'm very honored to be asked and have taken it as a great privilege. I've also taken it as an enormous responsibility to get only the word of the Lord, to live the word of the Lord, and to believe that the word of the Lord is going to make history in your lives. I haven't come here for anything less. To be real is to fulfill your destiny. Do you know what your destiny is? I hear all kinds of answers from pulpits about that. There's only one destiny according to the word of God. It's being conformed to the image of Jesus. That's your destiny. So, okay, where do we start? Always with God and prayer. To pray effectively, we need to prepare our hearts. Now, I've got the teaching on the uh, nine principles for effective intercession we're cutting, slicing right into the barest bones of that tonight. And there are three main things that we need to have a heart to pray for refugees, even if you can't get to the nine principles to get the maximum. Here's the three, simple. A clean heart, 1 John 1, 9. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So don't waste your time praying. <laughs> without a clean heart. Just run a bath and watch TV or something. You might as well, because he's not going to hear you anyway. If, I, if there is any undealt with sin in your heart or mind, forget it before you pray. I suggest that you do business with the Holy Spirit as you go through this message because it may be too much of an accumulation at the end to have to repent of. If you've been at all complaining, confess it and repent of it now and believe Jesus' blood to cleanse you so that you are able to receive the rest of the challenges. Second, a compassionate heart a heart that can weep with anguish and feel their pain and hopelessness and utter despair. Recognize that this is only impossible by the oncoming of the Holy Spirit. We can't have a compassionate heart without the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So ask for his control and receive it by faith. He will produce the compassion. Third little simple requirement is a heart full of faith. 
Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Do you know that you can be all night fasting and praying? You can be all week fasting and praying. You can be 40 days fasting and praying, as lots of people in America have been in the month of January. And you can do that all through the 40 days. And if your heart is not full of faith in what you're asking for, you're sinning. Sinning, fasting and praying? Yes, without faith. Romans 14, 23, what is not of faith is sin. Simple. With those three, that's all you need to start, just to start to have a prayer life for the millions of refugees in desperate need who are our neighbor. How do we intercede effectively? One, we ask God for an invasion of the Holy Spirit's mighty power from headquarters heaven to sovereignly fall upon the refugee camps and run down buildings where refugees are living and overpower them and overcome them with his comforting mercy, grace, strength, and joy. You say, how? You expect me to believe that God's going to do all those extravagant adjectives you just described in these, in these refugee camps now? Yes. Yes, I do. I'm going to base it on God's word. First of all, I base it on who he is, which comes from his word. Two, we ask for a mighty visitation of the glory of God in his holiness to invade their space and you're still reeling, you think, can I really pray for that, just little me, that I can pray for that and believe that he'll do all that? Yes, and I'm going to tell you one of the most marvelous stories that I never, ever get tired of reading out to audiences. <laughs> this is just the greatest, because I'm going to tell you what he did. This is to charge your faith batteries. Not long ago, 500,000 refugees, I'm reading it because this is a report and I want to get it exactly right as it was told in an article, written in an article. Not long ago, over 500,000 refugees filled, uh, fled sorry, from Mozambique, which was in civil war and gripped by famine. Some went to a refugee camp just inside South Africa where there was little or no water and faced near starvation from the meager daily ration of food in searing heat. The stench of human excrement was overpowering. A young missionary working among them asked for the Jesus film. The Jesus film, for, does anybody not know what the Jesus film is? I'll gladly tell you. Just be honest. Okay, fine. The Jesus film, thanks for your honesty. You're not ignorant, you just haven't had a chance to hear. Um, the Jesus film comes out of Campus Crusade for Christ International, one of the largest missionary organizations in the world today. The vision was given of this film being made to um, Dr. Bill Bright. The, he and his wife, Vinette were the founders of Campus Crusade for Christ. And in the early 70s, God gave Bill Bright the, the vision of a film being made from um, the Gospel of Mark, of the life of the Lord Jesus, from his birth, all his life, his death, his resurrection, and every single word of it is just straight scripture. So that's how authentic it is. And uh, when I say the Jesus film now, you'll know what I'm talking about. 
A young missionary working among this, these refugees asked for the Jesus film to be shown in the camp. As the film wasn't yet translated into the Shangang language, which most of the people spoke, the missionary said he would interpret it as it was being shown. He had led 30 people to Christ in, in these appalling conditions in this refugee camp and had formed a church in the camp. As the film crew were setting up the screen and the sound system, they heard the witch doctors chanting and saw them throwing bones on the ground in satanic rituals. With howling incantations, they began calling up the spirits of their ancestors. Satan was obviously angry at what was taking place. The film team called the Christians together for spiritual warfare and get this, an intense intercession for three hours. Huge key. At dark, 1,000 refugees of the 500,000 came to see the film. The witch doctors stopped their dancing. With the English soundtrack playing low and with microphone in hand, the interpreter translated line by line all that was taking place on the big screen. Between real changes, and there are four real changes and three changes, he told them why it was important that Mary be a virgin and how only a supernatural man could be God. One of the team reporting about this said, during the scenes of the crucifixion in the fourth 30 minute reel, we sensed something unusual was happening. Everyone suddenly started to cry. Women, men, and children. A mournful wailing gradually rose from the crowd into a relentless crescendo. As Jesus was being pushed down the Via Dolorosa in the film, the weeping became louder and totally uncontrollable. When the Roman soldiers started nailing Jesus to the cross, many of the people jumped up and ran toward the screen with their hands in the air, crying out to God. Everywhere people were confessing their sins. The film was forgotten. Rivers of tears poured down their dirty cheeks. Men beat their breasts and cried out, Oh God, oh God. Some were on their knees, some stood with their eyes closed and arms raised. Others lay prostrate on the ground. And then I love this next sentence. <laughs> Even the interpreter, the visionary, was lying on his back in the dirt, praying, thanking God, crying, praising, and worshiping. These people were in the presence of a holy God. They were overwhelmed by a sense of their sinfulness and wanted desperately to be forgiven. Someone turned off the projector. There was no film showing. The film team rushed to pray with and counsel those who were seeking God so desperately, but they couldn't speak, not one word. One by one, the team members themselves fell to their knees, confessing their own sins. In reporting, the team leader said, I felt the awesome power of God. I felt his love, his compassion, his care. It was overpowering. It was a wave that welled up inside us and we couldn't contain it. We were totally, irrevocably, hopelessly in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. That's my favorite line. And the experience just burst out of us with confession and tears, praise and worship, and a feeling of total wonder. The leader went on to say, I saw, now the leader would be the most mature amongst them. I saw a nine-year-old boy crying out to God. I turned to pray for him, but I couldn't because I was crying too much myself. 
a 70-year-old man with his eyes open and his hands in the air repeated over and over again, I just saw Jesus. I just saw Jesus. Remember, there's no film. He's having a vision of Jesus right in front of his eyes. But we were not just seeing the portrayal of Jesus, we were feeling his presence as powerfully and so powerfully we couldn't take it in. They couldn't comprehend it. It was beyond their comprehension. I have the greatest temptation to stop here and start preaching on what real revival is. I've got books on it series of messages, and I'll have to go on. Revival is not evangelism. It's the absolutely, totally awesome presence of God where his holiness is revealed and the unholiness of our hearts are revealed first. Not power, not miracles I'm talking about. Our hearts. This was the real thing. The leader's wife said, I started to pray with one woman, but I couldn't speak. Totally speechless, couldn't utter a word. I was overcome and began confessing my own sins. The sense of God's presence, his power and holiness was so great that no one could do anything con but confess their sins. That's real revival. I knew I was in a holy place. These people had nothing. I mean nothing, not even enough water. And God decided to give them a chance right there in that filthy camp to feel his presence and his overwhelming love. More than 30 minutes passed. Still the sounds of weeping and passionate prayer filled the field. The leader went to the interpreter and said, <laughs> this is a scream. Remember the interpreter's down on the, in the dirt? The missionary on his back. Hey, we need to finish the film so that they will know the good news of the resurrection. All across the audience, the people continued to wipe tears from their eyes. They saw the burial of Christ, and then the interpreter explained to the crowd, Jesus died to make the payment for our sins, but death could not hold him. And with that, he pointed to the screen and shouted with uncontainable, uncontainable joy, and there he is, he was raised from the dead. The crowd exploded as if a dam had burst. Everyone began cheering and dancing, hugging one another and jumping up and down. The film team never finished showing the film. An invitation was given for them at that point for those who wanted to receive Christ to come to the front. They all wanted to accept him as their savior and Lord, the whole 1,000 people. <laughs> who can know or understand God's ways? We can't, the Bible says so, they're past finding out. Romans 11:33 These people had absolutely nothing. They were totally hopeless. They desperately needed to know love to belong to someone. That night, that holy night, heaven came down to hell on earth. Through much prayer, remember they were 3 hours in intensive intercession. God brought to their impoverished, darkened hearts his incredible love. They had never heard of Jesus, but that night they experienced him and his touch. What a night, what a God. You may give an appropriate response to what God did that night. I leave it to you.
Remember, this remarkable story started with one young missionary who had learned the language of this people group and had evangelized and led 30 people to Christ and was discipling them. Don't forget that. It started there. Third point in how do we pray effectively? Jesus commanded us to ask God, the Lord of the harvest, to thrust forth laborers into the harvest field of the world. In this case, the refugee camps, and believe that he will. Four, we ask God to dispatch angels to meet their diverse needs, as he did in Bible times. Now, I'm going to read to you, um, at least I'm going to share with you, eight ways in which angels can come to us, and I ne you need to hear this and hear it well. This is not an exhaustive Bible study on how God can use angels. Because we're in a strict time uh, limit frame tonight, all I could do is come up with just eight out of many more. But these are practical ways, and they are ways that I use frequently, constantly, as a way of life when I'm praying for angels to be dispensed to people in need. So here we go with the eight, and I'll go through them very, very quickly. We can, we can ask God to protect and defend the people in the refugee camp. Psalm 91, 11, he will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Two, they will come to strengthen in a time of great trials as with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22, 43, and there appeared an angel from heaven strengthening him. When we see something in the word, how God dispensed an angel, we can know, we, we can ask it again. And these are just eight of some of the most practical. They can cook a meal in the most impossible circumstances. I've had a lot of fun praying for God to send angels to cook meals in, in the most impossible places. He did it before. Why didn't he do it again? It's no problem to God. It's only problem to unbelieving Christians. At least three people responded. <laughs> they, thank you for getting it. In 1 Kings 19, an angel baked a cake on hot stones and gave Elijah a jar of water when he was alone, exhausted, and wanted to die. These are alone, exhausted, and wanting to die. Do you know that in Korea, I have to stop and tell you this, the torture is so terrible to the Christians in the concentration camps. They pray to die and can't. They hang them up by their, they hang them up with their feet in the air and leave them for days hanging like that. Do you think we might put in a prayer once in a while for them? Do you think we'll stop murmuring? Say to yourself, I don't have a problem in the light of this. Go on, say it to yourself. Archangels, four, can, can bring us a message from God of wisdom while we're interceding for a nation or needy people group. An archangel did that for Daniel, Daniel four. Five, archangels can join forces together to defeat Satan's power and plans to hinder our intercession for a nation from being effective. Do you read Daniel and you say, that, that was for the prophet Daniel. I can't ask for that, why not? Give me one reason because of who God is and it's in the word. That's enough. Six, they can miraculously deliver from prisons. Acts chapter 12, verse seven. An angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up and the chains fell off his hands. If the angels can do all this for those who are trapped and believe there is no hope Angels can do it again if we believe. 
Seven, angels can give us directions for the unexpected ministry assignment. Acts chapter 8, 38. An angel told Philip to lead a, leave a successful evangelistic outreach among the Samaritans and go to, um, toward Gaza by the desert road to have a very uh, strategic encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch who got converted. But an angel showed up and says, hey, quit going there, go there. Lastly, an angel showed up for a divine appointment with Paul in the middle of a horrendous storm at sea at night and gave him a strong word of encouragement that no lives would be lost, Acts 27. It, those are just eight of the top off the top of many more. But every single one of them, God wants us to use and pray that that will happen in the refugee camps. We ask five for the word of God. How do we pray effectively? We ask God for the word of God to get to them in their language. With our modern technology today, micro SD cards and audio Bibles can be used to reach large numbers. Six, we ask for the Jesus film to get to them. It has been translated, now get this, one film, gospel film, of the book of Mark has been translated into 1,382 languages in the world today and is one of the greatest end time tools for evangelism. I don't know a greater tool for end time evangelism than that Jesus film. Personal video tablets are also being greatly used by God to show the Jesus film to large numbers of unbelievers. Condition eight, we ask that they will choose, this is the, the millions outside Christ in these dreadful uh, conditions in these refugee camps. They're there, because they're innocent people and they've been done dreadful damage and it's, it has nothing to do with their choices. That, that we have to pray that they will choose to forgive their enemies that have caused their suffering and loss. We ask that the, these millions of refugees in these ghastly conditions will experience God's healing power in their minds, their bodies, their souls, and their spirits. Psalm 147 verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds when we pray in, with a clean heart, in love, in faith. We ask that they will be empowered by the Holy Spirit, 10, to become soul winners. You say, soul winners? If they could just get healed or saved. Yes, why? Because God says in Isaiah 52, 10, the Lord will lay bare his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. That includes these over 9 million refugees and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of, the, of our God. He wants to save them. He wants to empower them by the Holy Spirit and he wants to make them soul winners if we will pray in faith. Are there any signs of these promises becoming a reality today? Muslims strong, do, do, yes, sir, is the answer. Muslims strongly believe in dreams and visions. So the more Christians pray for God to reveal Jesus to them, the more they will experience seeing him in dreams and visions. He tells them in the visions, I'm Jesus, the son of God, your savior. A pastor in northern Iraq estimates that about 80% of the Muslims he has met who have come to know Christ as Savior did so uh, having a dream about Jesus. One such man is in this pastor's church now leading Muslims to Christ. His story, I love this, his story is that in a dream, Jesus came to him and in this way, First of all, he saw all the prophets, that was the first thing, coming one by one, starting with Moses. That would be quite a trip, wouldn't it? Seeing all the prophets, everyone from Moses. They were all lined up and he saw them and he knew who they were. At the end, he, at the end, he saw Jesus coming seemingly as the last one. Now remember, he's a Muslim. 
is a devout Muslim. And it seems as though he's the last one. So he said he waited for Muhammad to come because to Muslims, he is the last one. But nobody showed up. When he asked, well, where is the last one in the dream? They all said in unison, Jesus is the last one. So he just believed and became a Christian. Wait a minute, hold the clap. Just a minute. He not only believed, became a Christian, he's now a pastor. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah to Jesus. I've totally lost track of the time. I've got, can I have a few minutes more? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're so gracious. That wasn't a cliche. He is gracious. And he didn't have to say that. And I've been in instances when they wouldn't have said that to me. He's very gracious. He said, okay, during a recent four month period, the same pastor who heard this testimony of this guy has baptized 15 new believers, eight of whom were former Muslims. He said they remain committed to Christ during intense persecution. Many of these refugees are disillusioned Muslims who are repulsed by what ISIS is doing and are seriously questioning their religion. Why? There's a reason. Because Satan always goes too far and overplays his hand. Why? Because he thinks that by getting Muslim extremists in Syria to carry out the grossest atrocities on, on Christians like literal, literal things, literal, like beheading them and starting to play soccer with their heads in front of their families. These are literal happenings. And killing children by putting them in ovens. This is, a, this is one sentence, there's a comma there. And kidnapping women, raping them and leaving them naked in the streets. Some women are raped by 10 men at a time and left dead case histories. Satan thinks all this horror will cause Christians to retreat, freak out, and go into hiding in terror worldwide. But, ha ha, I hope he's listening. Satan has no wisdom. He doesn't know. He doesn't know how to strategize because godly wisdom only comes with the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9, 10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He has no fear of the Lord. He has no wisdom, so he doesn't know how to strategize and always goes too far. Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood, which he has, guess what? The Lord will raise up a standard against him, which he's doing. A missionary in the Middle East reports that multiplied thousands, this is a missionary recently, re recent report, just one missionary, multiplied thousands that he knows of Muslims have come to Christ in recent years. He's not talking about some statistic that, that he knows that. A Syrian pastor reports, before the four and a half years of civil war in Syria, not many people attended church. But now thousands of families attend the, attend the evangelical churches in Syria from among Catholics, Orthodox, and Muslims. And they came as refugees to Damascus. See, it's in the refugee camps in that area that God is meeting them. He says, we are distributing hundreds of thousands of Bibles, mostly to Muslims. Did you get that? Hundreds, we are distributing hundreds of thousands of Bibles, mostly to Muslims. You're allowed to shout hallelujah in this church. There are signs on the church doors, quote, the church offers a free gift of a New Testament to anyone who wants one. End of quote, 
and people by the day are coming past and going into the churches and asking for the, the, asking for the Bible. Another reports from Syria. Oh, I love this story. Ooh, wow. Thank you, Jesus. The terrorists announced on Facebook recently that 30,000 of them, Muslims, were going to attack a city when they had finished Friday prayers at 1.15 the next day. A few believers, now get this, 30,000 of the enemy and a few believers. Who's on the winning side, guys? Come on. A few believers rose early in the morning to fast and pray. It was a bright sunny day, not a cloud in the sky. Right on time, the terrorists, Muslims, went into the streets shouting and walking around the city. Ha <laughs> ha, then God showed up. Suddenly, out of nowhere, clear blue sky, suddenly heavy rain, heavy rain came, which then turned immediately into huge hailstones. And in 15 minutes, no one was left in the streets. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. God has started to pour out his spirit in power and mighty miracles of salvation with signs and wonders among the nations. I have a whole heap of evidence to prove this that I could keep you here for hours listening to the stories of what is happening now in the universe on that scale. I'm all through, Pastor. It's over to you. So I pray for us that we wouldn't stand up and cheer, we wouldn't just scream and yell, but we would go home and crawl on our face before you and say, God, help me. Father, help me to become the man, the woman, the child, the follower of the king of the kingdom that I'm supposed to be. In times like this, you have put us in such a time as this because you wanted us to be on the planet when ISIS was raping, murdering, and beheading people. You wanted us to be on the planet, not to live in fear, but that you could empower us with faith, that we could stand with our brothers and sisters throughout the planet, wherever they would be, in Nigeria, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, wherever they would be, that we would believe for you to touch the hearts of the lost, the broken, the needy. So Father, even as I said that day when I went to the mosque after the shooting in San Bernardino, and I said, you don't have to be afraid of us because Jesus teaches us one thing that's very, very clear. We have to love our neighbor and you are our neighbor. So Father, I pray for the Muslims in our community there are so many here today that we wouldn't live in fear of them, but we would believe for their repentance and their salvation. We would pray dreams and visions over the mosque when we drive by. We would pray release of, of healing when we drive by. We would pray, Father, for you to win imams to Jesus, that you, Holy Spirit, would do what we can't do. You would create opportunities for us to witness to Muslims, and then we would be bold enough to speak your name. So Father, we pray for help. We pray for repentance. We pray for your grace to fall on us in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night.
and died that they might live again. So take my healing to the nations, bind their broken hearts with love. Stretch my hand throughout creation with this message of my love that I came to bring light in their darkness and bring joy where there once was pain take my healing to the nations bind their broken hearts with love for the fields they're ready for harvest and the laborers they're so few countless millions still that i want to fill but the task isn't mine to do i gave him my commandment go and preach good tidings of love for i finished the work on calvary and their healing's already been done so take my healing to the nations bind their broken hearts with love stretch my hand through our creation with this message of my love that I came to bring light in their darkness and bring joy where there once was pain. Take my healing to the nations, bind their broken.